Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast. Last week, Carl and I did part one of this two-part series on Benjamin Graham's book, The Intelligent Investor. So if you're just showing up here for part two, go back and check out the episode from last week to get part one, of course. And please go to onlinegreatbooks.com slash podcast and join our little email list. And you'll get our email newsletter every month. Uh, discount codes, offers for some of our courses that we do, like how to listen to music or our course on studying Euclid's elements and a whole lot other interesting stuff that goes on at onlinegreatbooks.com. Enjoy the show. You know, a lot of this is if the worst comes to worse, you don't care. You've got bigger problems. Yep. So at some point, risk becomes something I don't care about anymore. If the zombie apocalypse happens, I don't care that I will have lost my principal invested. Right. Because uh, we're trading ammo for food, either friendly like or not friendly. <laughs> yeah. I've got a friend that says she can trade bullets for food one way or another. <laughs> At some point, I'm not too worried about that. But I want to talk about something that was interesting to me this idea of dollar cost averaging. Yep. And he's got charts in here, and I won't be able to find it right now. But the idea is this. So you, you get your balanced portfolio, you get the balance that you want to have, and you're going to put a little bit in it every month. You're not going to worry about it. You're not going to necessarily change the numbers. Because when it is cheaper, you'll buy more. And when it's more expensive, you'll buy less. But over the long run, the cheaper stuff that you bought will work out better, mm-hmm. which is an interesting approach. Mm-hmm. And it's simple. You know, you just keep doing it. Except it doesn't work. Tell me why. Now, it might work for a salary man, but for Hamburg, who was always self-employed, I couldn't dollar cost average. Well, actually, I did, and it got me wrecked. It took me a long time to learn this. When times were fat and the stock market was soaring and business was good, I was making a lot of money. But when it was bad and the stock market was low, I might not have anything to spare to invest, to save. So I learned that I had to save the same amount every stinking month, but maybe not invest it and then invest on a value basis Hmm. because my income as a self-employed person tracked right along with the general economic conditions of the country. Okay. So when times were fat, I was buying more stocks at higher prices. When times were lean, I might not be buying anything but pork and beans and missing out on the dip. Okay. So you want to have the reverse of that. So let's say you're making, I don't know, you're making $5,000 a month and that's going to be reasonably steady. And you can put maybe 500 you can invest 500 a month, every month. Mm-hmm. If you can do that, then when the things are cheap, you'll be buying more. You'll be buying more shares for the same money. Yeah, more shares. You're, you're buying more shares for the same money. You're getting more eggs because eggs are cheap. And in your condition, it didn't work because your income was the same as the market. So when the market was high, you made money and it didn't really, so you didn't get the advantage of buying high is the wrong time to buy. And when you weren't having income, you couldn't put any money in the market, so you couldn't pick up any of the bargains by that technique. I think you should save every shekel you can and then invest by value investing criteria. But what if you're a defensive investor who doesn't have the time to do all the research? Well, that's a problem. (laughs) Uh, Well, I mean, it is. It's a real real live problem. One, you can find people that do. Mm Mm-hmm. That's not terribly hard. There are some value indexing funds. It's difficult to find out what their criteria are for what determining what a value is. But there's some out there. I can tell you about some, Carl. I won't tell you these other other people. <laughs> and you can you can go ahead and and buy in uh, those index funds and minimize that price or your costs. And and yet being dollar dollar cost averaging prevents you from doing any sort of market timing or doing anything irrational. It also prevents you from doing anything excellent too. Yeah. Well, I recognize that. I'm not sure I have the bandwidth to do anything excellent. Well, I I understand. I think Graham does too. But the dollar cost averaging thing can get the salary man too. Like, okay, I'm making 5000 a month. I'm saving 10% of that. Okay, it's March of 2020. I'm out of work. Stock market fell 29%. Can't buy anything. You still get shut out of those lows. 
and buying on the lows is really important, even for the, the defensive investor. Now, maybe the story is you just can't get in when you lose your job and the stock market's off a third. Maybe you're just not going to get that. That's Those are the breaks, you know. That concerns me. So for me, and I know not everybody is at the same constitution and so on, but for me, you know, it's I figure it's part of my business to spend some time on that, doing at least some of that research and having a sense of where things were. And I'll tell you, if you do this for a long time, if you do this for a long time, you'll get a sense of where those values are and it becomes quicker and faster and easier and cheaper for you to do the research. Mm-hmm. And you'll have, you'll have some stocks you got your eye on. And you're like, man, you know, if that would fall, if that Johnson and Johnson would just fall about eight points, I could probably drop the hammer on that. You know, you kind of know where you want to be on some of the, on some of these things and can be, can be ready at a fairly low time cost, you know? All right. So would your advice be then, Save money. Yeah. <laughs> save money and then <laughs> save money, do research, buy on the lows rather than put your 500 in every month. No, it's not buy on the lows. It's buy when the value is there. Okay. Which typically is when it's low. Yeah. But, you know, I could foresee a, a situation in the next hot whatever where we end on top of the, the Wuhan, we'll get the armadillo flu on top of it, and then Taiwan falls. And it it could potentially be that eight months after that condition, we've had two, let's say, no, let's say 12 months after that happens, we've had two or three bad quarterly reports, and there is not a good value to be seen in the entire stock market that would meet your criteria. Then you shouldn't buy anything. It doesn't matter how low it goes, Mm -hmm. you don't speculate. If nobody's paying dividends, everybody's debt's high, everybody's price to earnings ratio looks dumb, et cetera, et cetera, then you wouldn't buy a darn thing. You just sit on your hands. And wait. All right. Well, maybe we ought to talk about some of these criteria then. So. Hey, listen, you don't want that armadillo flu. No. You know what it is? It's leprosy. Yeah. Armadillos give you leprosy. No, you, nobody wants that. So let's, we can talk about his criteria. He says that we've got to have objective and rational tests for determining what the underlying value of a stock is. And it's got to be a different policy than the one followed by most people where it won't work. If it's what everybody does, price discovery and the rationality of the market will work. Some of the fascinating bits of the book were his talking about the various systems that people have had for stock picking that will work for three years. Yep. And then everybody finds out about it and then everybody does it and then it doesn't work anymore. Yeah. How many copies of this book have sold? Whole bunch. Are there enough people doing value investing that it doesn't work anymore? Uh, Nope. I don't know. Maybe. Damn sure doesn't work as good as it did for him. Yeah, I had a friend who ran a hedge fund for a little bit, and he had to quit because the the computers were trading faster than he could. Yeah. There were no margins anymore to be found. So uh, he's got some preconditions here when you're doing your homework. Not preconditions. I don't know. Prerequisites when you're doing your homework. So we'll give the rules here in a minute. But he says, first of all, you need to look at five years of their financial statements. Uh, you want to just throw out people that are companies, not people. Companies aren't people, Carl. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> Supreme Court doesn't know that, but I know that it or not. Uh, he says you want to throw out any companies that are serial acquirers or use what he calls OPM, other people's money. Throw them out. So you're looking for companies that have a big competitive advantage. Buffett calls it the moat. Like uh, Harley Davidson, nobody else can make Harley Davidsons because it's not even about the bi- the motorcycle. It's about the brand. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a brand everybody loves so much. They're like tattooed on their bodies. It's crazy. Yep. So they have a huge mode and, and you're looking, so you're looking for quality of earnings. You know, they keep coming in and does the company have a history of giving those earnings back to the people who own the company. And he also is looking for companies that consistently spend on R and D and then have something to show for it too. Uh, and that goes to their quality of management. So, and he, so he's also looking, you know, we don't want any stupid CEO salaries and stuff like that. And then beyond that, he has some real live numbers or not, rules. He's got about 10 rules here that I've kind of put in my own words that we can go through here in a second. But about the OPM and the acquiring, Carl, there's a game that's being played and has been played for a long time. I benefited from this game once. If you work for Carl Co. and Carl Co. trades publicly on the New York Stock Exchange at a price to earnings ratio of, let's say, 28. No, let's not say 28. That's stupid. Let's say 30 because that makes my math easier. (laughs) 30. That's generous. That's uh, pretty fat. I don't want to buy that company. 
So for every dollar that that company earns in a year, the stock is worth 30 bucks up front. So you're paying $30 for a, you're paying 30 bucks today for a hamburger tomorrow, essentially, right? Yeah. Well, for a dollar's worth of earnings, hamburgers aren't a dollar anymore. Yeah. Well, most big companies have got small and regional competitors that aren't publicly traded. So they will often take OPM, other people's money, they'll borrow, and they go buy mom and pops and pay eight, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve EBITDA <laughs> earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortizations. So they'll figure out what mom and pops earnings are EBITDA, pay them eight times that, and then roll it up into their company. So they may pay eight hundred thousand dollars. The numbers are actually going to be much larger for larger. It's going to be much larger businesses than this. But maybe they'll pay eight hundred thousand dollars for a hundred thousand dollars worth of earnings over at mom and pop's shop, and then roll it up into their big publicly traded company. They'll capture a few uh, economies of scale. They can, they might be able to run mom and pop a little cheaper, and they can probably lay some people off. You know how they do. But now they have a hundred thousand dollars worth of earnings they can report on their annual report. And they know that it makes the stock market values them in the 28 to 30 times earnings deal. So the stock will go up mm -hmm. $3 million for 800,000 of debt for 800 up front. And so if the, if the executive team's being compensated with uh, stock options and they're playing a bunch of funny games, they do that stuff all day long, all day long. And in fact, that's how I dumped my last business and they paid too much for it. And I think they know that now. But the check cleared, so I don't care. Do they listen? They ought to. <laughs> I'll buy it back for them for 10% uh, of what they paid for it. Let me know, guys. <laughs> if anybody wants to buy Carlco for 800000 you can have it. <laughs> it. Is your soul on the balance sheet? Is that one of the assets on the balance sheet? <laughs> no. Rule number one, he's looking for an earnings to price yield of twice the triple A bond. So here's an example. Okay. If the AAA bonds are paying eight points, then the required ye earnings yield would be 16%. One divided by eight. So you take the reciprocal of that. That's a price to earnings ratio of six and a quarter. So I think that's actually an example he put in the book. And you ain't going to find a AAA bond paying eight points nowadays. They're going to pay a point and a tenth. I don't know what they are right now. And your price to earnings ratios are going to be much, much higher. So a lot of the numbers that he talks about in this book, you're just not going to see right now. But that's that's rule number one. Let's go see what a AAA bond is yielding right now. So I was born in the 70s. I remember interest rates being really high. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like in the teens. And maybe they ought to be. Like we've had some big, big busts where a lot of people got hurt. You know, 2008 was terrible. This one right here is getting ready to be too awful. Why is it so hard for me to buy, find a AAA bond rating? What the heck is going on here? I don't know. You're going to have to send me your 10 rules written out. I'll do that. 2.15% is what it is today. So it's you know much, much lower than it was at that time. So, well, let's figure it out. What would our Grahamian PDE need to be? 100 divided that by that 2.15. Oh, my gosh. Earnings yield of 0.5% essentially. You know, very, very, very low. So I don't think that one, that one doesn't hold anymore. We can expect a better yield than that. So I've tossed that one out. Two, price to earnings ratio down to four tenths of the highest average price to earnings, earnings ratio the stock has attained in the most recent five years. Okay. So you wanted it 40% of its high? Yep. So if the last five years, the price to earnings ratio went to 20 you're going to want to get that in the eight area. That's pretty aggressive too for the current business climate, but you can you can come up with them that are in the 40% of their highs. They're 60% off their highs. You can find them. Now, pause. For, for the novice who just does the slider on my bank's website, all right, if I wanted to do this, I go to, where do I go to do it? I go to like finance at Yahoo are there ways to put in the criterion to find? Yeah. Or do I need to sit with a book and do the calculator? 
uh, you're going to have to do the calculator, but you can, uh, at least you used to be able to do it at Google Finance. They've got some sliders. You can put in some criteria in their stock screener. It'll yield you some results, and then you're going to have to look at the quarterly filings and the annual reports. They'll they'll make a, a small list for you. They'll take the mm-hmm. roughly 5,000 publicly traded stocks and choke it down to 25. 50, I don't know. And then you'll have to have to dig in a little further and you'll be able to throw some of them out. You know, you'll just know right offhand, you know, I don't even know what the hell that company does. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not buying alphabet. Right. Sorry. Because we're good people. So you'll throw out a bunch of those things. Number one was about earnings to price yield, by the way, which is different than dividend yield. I, I said it was dividend. That's not true. Rule three is you want a dividend yield of two thirds, the triple A bond yield. Well, you already said the AAA bond yield today is 2.15. So two-thirds of that would uh, mean you're looking for a dividend yield of 1.4% and some change. I don't use that one either because I can't retire on that. I have, I'm going to dem- demand a higher dividend yield. But the pickier I get, the smaller my list gets. Mm-hmm. It's okay. I don't care. Dividends are so good, Carl. If you're getting your dividends and they're meeting your needs, you might not ever need to sell sell a stock. So here's another question. Pardon me for interrupting, because I think I'm the perfect guy for this podcast, because I don't know anything about anything. So I'm going to ask you. So I do my investing with my sliders on my bank's website. I don't get the dividends, do I? You might. Or do they just get put back into the, the fund? In other words, I don't have a list of stock that I know that I own. Yeah, it depends on how the fund is built. You'd have to read your prospectus. <laughs> uh, yeah. There are some of these stocks you can buy individual stock and you can do what they call a DRIP, a dividend reinvestment program. And mm-hmm. it just pays you little bitty fractions of stock every quarter when you get a dividend and so you never get the cash. Yeah. Those, those things, but they also don't charge any fees on that. So that's efficient. Some of the stocks, like you can buy Spiders, S&P 500 depository receipts at the exchange traded index fund that you can buy like a stock. It'll pay, I, I believe it pays a dividend to you. Some mutual funds, you'll never, you won't see it. You won't see the dividend. It just goes into the cash and then they use it for further investment activity and rebalancing and stuff. Just depends. Don't know. Don't, mm-hmm. don't know. You have to see what you got. Sure like those dividends, man. Four, a stock price down to two thirds of the tangible book value per share. The book value is the carrying value on the balance sheet minus the depreciation and any of their debts. Or liabilities. Divided by the number of shares. Divided by the number of shares. Mm. I think I got that right. Somebody will correct me. It's pretty close. There might be something else that comes that's backed out of there. But that's pretty much it. So you want a stock that's less than the book value. You want to be buying more than you're paying for. Uh, the way I think about it is if the place went belly up and an auctioneer showed up and they auctioned everything they had, paid off all their debts, would there be any money left? Because that's all you're going to get as a shareholder. And if there's any money after the auction's left, you got a margin of safety there. And you want there to be about a third of the money left if they went belly up. Five, the stock price down to two-thirds of the net current asset value or net quick liquidation value. That's the um, assets minus the debt. Fixed assets aren't in there. That's like you know, real estate's not in there. That's just the current assets. It's, that's cash. There might be some contracts that would be called and cut in, put in there maybe. But in my Apple example from way back, easy peasy. We're there on all accounts. Mm-hmm. Didn't have to get my pencil real sharp on that one. <laughs> Six, total debt less than the tangible book value. Duh. And five kind of covers that, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Seven, the current ratio of two or more. Current assets divided by current liabilities gives you a value of two or better. Okay. All right. Eight, total debt equal or less than twice the net quick liquidation as defined in number five. Anyway, low debt, low debt, low debt, low debt. Okay. Number nine, earnings growth over the most recent 10 years of 7% compounded. So he wants to see that the earnings has grown at least 7% a year, resulting in it doubling over the last 10 year period. That's that rule of 72? Pretty much. Yeah. He says in here, you know, past performance isn't a prediction of future performance, but what else are you going to go on? Right. Anything else is speculative. So we look at the past performance, we build in a margin of safety, and then maybe we buy something. 
10. Stability of growth in earnings defined as no more than two declines of five points or greater in year-end earnings in the most recent 10 years. Our boom and bust cycles are a little more frequent now and a little weirder. That one's pretty hard to get. He's also has some stuff in here that isn't directly in the list that I think are important. He's looking for large companies. So what he defines as a large company is smaller than we would call large now. Well, what if you adjust for inflation? Is it similar or is it just weirder now? It's probably weirder now. But I think you want to be looking at S&P 500, you know, the big thousand. I think you need to be doing that maybe to prob- to maybe meet his criteria. You know, people would argue with this, but you need to be looking for big companies. You don't want penny stocks. And I like to see, you know, unbroken dividend payments, never miss a dividend. And it's, Mm -hmm. there are a lot of companies out there that haven't missed a dividend in over a hundred years, several dozen that haven't missed a dividend payment since the 1800s. There are dozens and dozens and dozens that haven't missed one in the last 20 years. So it's possible to find companies that are committed to paying their owners for their trouble. Yeah, somewhere in here there was a, oh, I can't remember which chapter, some analysis that companies that paid dividends, at least when he wrote this book, tended to do better than companies that didn't pay them. Yep. That you just did whatever they do with excess profits. So paying your profits out to your owners, I don't know, makes you more responsible with them? Yeah. You know, when your owners are used to getting that dividend check every quarter, You've heard of these widows and orphan stocks, you know, mm-hmm. these blue chip stocks. They're living on, a lot of these are that aren't institutional are living on those dividends and it's an instant barometer. Your dividend check didn't come in. You know, they didn't declare a new dividend this year. So I think that it increases the accountability and it leaves them with less cash to do stupid things with. I think it's really important, mm-hmm. you know, don't leave too much money in the till. Don't do that. You know, it would be, if we owned a general store, we would know to not do that. And as owners, we'd take a draw. The more you leave there in the till and in the safe, the more likely somebody's going to do something dumb with it. We don't do that. We pay that cash out. Yeah, that's the problem at Carl Co. Right. Yeah. Somebody's dipping into the petty cash again. <laughs> I don't like stock re- I don't like stock buybacks. He has some comments in here about them. He's not so. He's okay with stock buybacks when the company buys its own shares back, as long as they do it when the value is there. But I don't like it at all. Give me that money. I'll figure out if I want more shares of that company. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want Jack Welch figuring out if I want more GE or not. I'll I'll figure that out. You send me the money. I own this damn thing, not you. Yeah, so this would be dividends versus what, stock splits? No, buybacks. Hmm. So from time to time, a company may have a great deal of cash on hand, and they'll look at the stock price and they'll say, well, in the good world, they'd look at the stock and say, that is too cheap. That is too cheap. And they can reduce the number of shares outstanding. So that's a management decision. But if you own the stock, you're an owner of it. That's right. I mean, you're an owner. You're part of that management decision. Is that right? Well. (laughs) I mean, in theory, you know, perfect world. Well, but you're not because you probably, you you and I don't have a controlling interest. And uh, we probably give our proxy up to somebody else. And uh, even if we don't give up a proxy, we make a vote for somebody on the board of directors. You know, we ultimately really don't have much say as individual people on whether or not they do a buyback or they issue a dividend or they reduce it or increase it or anything else. Hmm. So pick the ones that do it. Pick the ones that do it. They've already demonstrated they do it. I sure like it when you see families on the board of directors that have been cashing those dividend checks for 50, 60, 70 years. You know, a widow so-and-so is going to just raise hell about her dividends. And I sure like that. Institutional investors, I think, have kind of changed that environment. Uh, Institutional investors would include mutual funds, pension plans, state retirement funds, things like that. Their goals are probably could be different, quite different than the individual investors' goals would be. And they get a little bigger vote than I would because CalPERS. California pension system ought to, right? I don't have that much money in whatever it is. I don't like being in opposition to those folks. I don't like that. Yeah. I'm just thinking what Belek would say about institutional investors. Yeah. Well, he actually says in the restoration of property that companies shouldn't be able to buy stocks. They shouldn't be able to hold investments. They should do their business activity. That's it. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's something, you know, as I read Graham here, 
that's something that concerns me about some of these businesses. Like, what is the business of General Electric? Generally Electric. <laughs> well, you know, if you went and got an MRI, they probably loaned the money to that clinic to buy the MRI machine. You know, they've got a huge financial division. Like, well, you know, what do they do? General Motors is mostly a healthcare provider. At this point, because they yeah. run a pension fund and a... They make a few cars, too. Right. You know, what does Berkshire Hathaway do? I don't know. Real estate around me. Everything? Yeah. I mean, everything. Those kinds of things concern me a little bit. And I think that they concern Graham as well because the companies are more difficult to understand and it's too difficult to understand where the earnings come from and what the quality of the earnings is. A lot of qualitative stuff in here, you know? Mm-hmm. So you can see as we go went down through these rules here that a lot of them are, like, our, like my friend last night said, well, they're outdated. Those numbers don't hold anymore. But I, I wonder if Graham wouldn't say, well, then you shouldn't buy anything because these numbers are real and they're right. I wonder if he would say, I would like to be able to dig him up and ask him, you know, would you just bow out of this then? Would you go do something different? Mm -hmm. I think there's a very good chance that he would. If you go read all of Buffett's annual reports, you'll see years when he does almost no investment activity whatsoever. Hmm. Those are available somewhere, right? Yeah, you can go to, I think it's at BerkshireHathaway.com. All of his letters to the shareholders and all of his uh, annual reports are there. And they make good reading, really good reading. I'm going to have to see if I can find a value stock, just as an exercise. They're out there. The mechanics of doing it, how do yeah. you go about doing it? What what numbers do you run? But that's the attraction to the index funds and the slider approach. You know, I, I don't know how to do this. It's got math involved. You know, we know that math is hard and a lot of people don't want to think about it. You're a math nerd, though. I am. But I'm also a person whose brain turns off when there's a dollar sign, which is a problem. That's not the way it should be. But, you know, not to get into current events, but you can see this all the time. There's all sorts of stats coming out about the current situation we're in where they leave out the denominator. You know? The, talking about numbers of cases without talking about numbers of tests or, or general population. And a lot of people are not mathematically sophisticated enough to figure out that they're, they're leaving the denominator out. This information they're giving me is pointless. It's like giving a number in engineering. We always got marked very badly if we didn't put the unit on. Mm -hmm. The answer is 15. 15 what? 15 newtons? 15 kilograms? 15... British thermal units, you know? Shoots. Yeah. For most people, math is an undiscovered country. Yeah. But it's not that hard. No, it's not. Especially with an HP calculator. This is arithmetic. It's not algebra or calc or anything like that. By the way, go to onlinecreatebooks.com slash podcast and sign up for our VIP waiting list. And um, you can go to uh, onlinecreatebooks.com slash audit and sign up for some of our freebie sessions where we're going to talk about Creativity, or C.S. Lewis, or Walker Percy, or Ayn Rand. You can sign up for one or more of those little sessions and get a little taste of what we do, because we're like the pusher man, the first hits free. Because mm -hmm. we know once that needle goes in, you can't quit us. <laughs> Yet the game is very, very strange right now. I'm pretty nervous about it. To value invest is really to bet against the Fed, I think. Explain what you mean yeah. by that. Well, the, the 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 Fed is pumping cash in by issuing cash to banks that can then be frees up supposedly deposits that they can lend to borrowers. Uh, but that doesn't jive to me because nobody has any money deposited. That's why we're in an economic crisis, uh, and money's fungible. So when they loan money to a bank to shore up their reserves. And they say, well, you, you gave me this dollar to shore up my reserves. I'm going to go loan out that one. Well, they're fungible. If the Fed sends a dollar over and you lend out a dollar, it might as well have been the same one. I mean, the one the Fed gave you, it mm -hmm. doesn't matter. And all that liquidity, all that cash is going somewhere. You can go do a little, little bit of research on the internet. And you'll see that they haven't written a whole lot of mortgages this year compared to last year. So the Fed is making this money available to their member banks ostensibly to loan, but they're really not, they're not doing that. They're not writing a whole lot of home mortgages. The rates are low, but they're not writing as many as they have in the past. Where's it all going? 
Well, the capitalization on these big five stocks is going through the roof. There seems to be quite a bit of evidence mm -hmm. that somehow it's contributing to pushing those things up. The higher those stocks go, maybe I'm full of it here, the more likely that people will pay at least slightly higher prices for our value stocks. Because compared to the other ones, they look better, even at worse numbers. If Tesla's $1,000 a share and they've never made a groat yet, and your little, your little value stock is trading at half book, people are more likely to pay 60% book because it's still relative to what else, what other options are out there is low. I don't know exactly how it works. You're thinking it's making everything overpriced. It seems like it. It seems okay. like it should. Yeah. Uh, somebody would probably say, well, that liquidity doesn't seem to be chasing value stocks. But value stocks are comp uh, on the shelf and being compete are competing with the whole panoply of possible equities to buy. Yeah. It seems like the higher prices would buoy everything higher because of the way competition works. All right, so there's a line in here that that I underlined, page one fifty seven. There would seem be little point in trying to determine new levels for buying and selling out of the market pattern since nineteen forty nine. That is too short a period to furnish any reliable guide to the future. Mm -hmm. So he's writing in 72 that 30 years or, well, 20, 23 years, I guess, is too short. And if you consider the time that there has been a market, how long has there been a stock market? A couple hundred, maybe. How much time is that to establish patterns? None. Right, right. It's like a weather. Every, every year there's a new high and a new low. And people think the weather's changing. Well, you don't know if the weather's changing. You only have 130 years of weather data. Yeah. So attempts to to do chart investing and figure out, you know, where the market's going to go, you're just not going to be able to do it. Yeah, you know, this historical data, that's something that I wanted to mention that I'm glad you brought this up, really bugs me. Because, I mean, at, at the most, people are talking about 120, 150 years worth of stock market data. And they'll say, well, you know, over its history, over any 10-year rolling period, the st uh, uh, stock market has yielded 7.4, maybe 8%, depending on who you talk to, you know, something like that. So 150 years isn't anything. Name all the 500-year-old companies you know of. Um, Beretta. Beretta and like two in Japan or something. You know? Mitsubishi. You know, and when there are a lot, a great number of companies that we know of that are cherished brands that have never net on net on net, never made a shekel. American Airlines never made any money. So, you know, chasing that return, that quote unquote market return, um, I don't think we actually know what that market return is supposed to be. We just know what it has been right. of late. Well, I don't think we know what it is. I just pulled up a chart. I'm looking at Alphabet stock from 2006 to 2020, the stock price, at least the latest one in this chart, is $1,507 per share. It's kind of interesting. The uh, It has the price per earnings ratio, which peaked at 58 in 2017, but has come down since then to 33. It was lower than that. It was down in the 20s. But there is no appreciable dip in the shape of the stock price going up. It's just kind of kept going up with a couple of bounces. So it seems to be independent of their earnings. Does that make sense? Yeah. What are people doing? Everybody's putting money into, into Google. And so everyone else is putting money into Google. What are they doing, though? Are they investing? Are they speculating? Speculating. Uh, some of them may be investing. Maybe they're growth investors. You know, maybe they think they have good reason to believe that, you know, that the growth will be there. Heck, they might be right. They may hoover all the cash out of the whole universe. You know, the way we're going, it looks like we're going to have four companies left. The rest of us are going to be eating soylent and open cardboard boxes from uh, Google's on. <laughs> Google's on makes terrible food. God. <sighs> I'm sure they do. Yeah, so that that's kind of weird and fascinating. So what's a person to do? I don't know. I, I seriously don't know, but Reed Buffett, he's a value investor, or he used to be. He's not what you think he is. Not anymore. He's not your kindly old grandpa. He wants to kick your ass and take your money. That's pretty clear, I think. I think he would tell you that, actually. I never thought he was a kindly old grandpa. 
No, that that Will Rogers all shucks thing. That guy's carnivorous. And, but you should read him, and you should read Graham. And whatever you do, you need to have a rational basis for it, and have a set system of rules. Well, wait. You should have a set concept of what you believe the thing is that you're buying, right? And you like get metaphysically clean on the thing. And then you need to have a set of rules that you use to determine whether or not you should buy it or not. And then at least you'll have stuck a stake in the ground. And when you've messed up, you'll be able to know why you did what you did. And then you can make changes. They can be mm-hmm. rational. At minimum that, if you don't buy in with his plan. Incidentally, I, I looked up Apple. Price per earnings mm-hmm. and t- price per earnings ratio and stock price mirror pretty exactly in the last 10 years. Yeah, good. So that's interesting. Google, not so much. Did you hear Sumner Redstone died? I did. Age 97. Yeah, it's a good run. I, well, I don't know. I got to see him talk. Oh, yeah. A while back at a graduation for a business school in Chicago, and they wheeled him up on stage, and he was he was old then. And I'm, he's been old for 50 years. <sighs> he says that uh, people will tell you that you know, family is most important, but they're wrong. It's the deal. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. $6 billion at age 97. Well, good for you, Sumner. His goals are different, I think, than, uh, than reasonable goals would be. <laughs> than reasonable goals. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, but I I think the big takeaways are is that the thinginess that he sees in companies, I think, is important. Um, I see them as real life companies. And again, because I've I've treated everything that I do in the same way. I bought up some little competitors at three, four, five times earnings, you know. Well, why would I if if I'm uh, if I can buy a competitor whose industry I completely understands because I understand because I already operate in that area and I can buy them for three, four, five times their earnings. Why would I buy a stock at eight, 10, 12, 15, where I have no control or maybe no understanding of what it is they do. I'll take the closely held company that I understand at the lower, at the low, at the better value. And you know this gets me in trouble. I talk about it on a live sometimes. That's why I'm really not that interested in the 401k, you know, screw the matching. I don't care. Because I can't go buy the things I know and that I know I can find value in in my 401k. I can't go buy my competitor down the street inside of 401k. I need to have ready cash that I actually own free and t- have free and clear title to so I can operate the way I need to. And I don't in the 401k. If you're not the kind of person that buys businesses like that, then eh, maybe it's okay. But my point is, though, that I've treated the menu of options in front of me with rational criteria like this. And um, it's been okay. Mm-hmm. Might not continue to be. Price to earnings ratio on um, Tesla, according to Bing, is 800. Oh, gosh. But I don't think that's correct because I don't think they've had any earnings. It's infinite. It's divided by zero. Right. I was hoping to see the lazy zero there. But, yeah. Now, why would anybody buy Tesla... Let's be Tesla apologists. Why would you buy it if they don't make any money? Because everyone else is buying it. Do, do they have a high likelihood of actually making money? I don't know. And a whole lot? <laughs> Tesla reported revenue of $24.6 billion for fiscal year 2019, an increase of 251%. I don't care anything about revenue. Here's the next one. Income fell 27.7% to negative $862 million. <sighs> They're going to make it up on volume over there, Carl. <laughs> you make it up on volume. Do you remember the, the change bank? It's a Saturday yeah. Night Live skit. Change, that's all we do. You can give us a dollar. We can give you four quarters. Or we can give you two quarters and five dimes. Or we can give you 95 pennies and a nickel. It's what we do. And they say, well, how do you make any money? Volume. <laughs> that's what they're going to do. I'm getting addicted. I'm playing around on this uh, macrotrends.net, some company that gives 10% dividends. What? They're out there. Capital Southwest Revenue. They're out there. Well, is this a good book, Carl? Well, for me, I made it all the way through. I'd have to go through again. Coming from zero to something, I think it's real worthwhile. 
Yeah, I, I do too. There are people that are in this business are probably yelling that this is the wrong book and we should have read X, Y, Z and it's from whatever. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. But his rules and stuff, while I think they're good, that's not the important thing. The important thing is seeing how to create a framework for decision making in the financial world is is an important thing to to learn about. And um, it's an important thing for a person who spends money to develop for themselves. I've been yelling at my oldest daughter quite a bit lately because she'll say something like, uh, we broke our kitchen scissors, Carl. Oh, no. She says, we need to invest in some new kitchen scissors. I'm like, that is not an investment. That is an expense. It's a small tool. <laughs> it's not. People say that shit all the time. Oh, I need to invest in a new car. No, unless you're a delivery driver, it's strictly overhead. It kills you. It's not an investment. There's no chance of yield on it. Well, that slippery thinking about how you deal with money and using the wrong words and not thinking about it in the in the right ways, I think it leads people into big, bad problems. And I, I, I love his, like you said, what his... Uh, concept of the thinginess of businesses companies yeah what for next time carl what wait a minute you know what they need to do what they need to go listen to music and ideas podcast oh they do yes they do because most of you don't listen to it because we know what the downloads are we know what the downloads are for this show and we know what the downloads are for that show we're watching right there you you that's (laughs) listening i know that you didn't download it (laughs) go listen to carl and trent and me talk about i don't know led zeppelin Led Zeppelin was fun. Frank Sinatra. Yep, that one's in the can. Won't be long here. We're going to have one coming out about why opera does not stink. No, it's why opera doesn't suck. Oh, okay. Doesn't suck. That's coming out. I wanted to be a little vocal. Yeah. Though. So uh, go listen to that show, and then also go to onlinegreatbooks.com slash podcast and uh, join up for the little VIP waiting list, and when we kick enrollment to health. You already like ideas. You should like music, too. So music and ideas is for you. Is music an idea? Yes. Okay. It's a form. It's a form. <laughs> yeah. I want to paint a painting of this, the school of Tulsa. And you're going to be pointing up. And I'm going to be pointing out in front. Yep. And I know that uh, my opinions and my takes here probably will chafe some folks. And that's all right. Uh, email us about that. You can do, send that to podcast at onlinegreatbooks.com. Uh, we might read it on the air. And I will probably respond with why you're not right. <laughs> Let me, I want to dilate on that point for a moment. <laughs> so dilate. <laughs> we, have, we have had some wonderful Slack discussions recently. Like our, our Belloc podcast rubs a few people the wrong way. Yeah. Which is sure fine. Did. They rubbed me the wrong way. You know, I didn't want some of the things he said to be true, but I think I kind of think they are. But we've had marvelous discussions on our open discussion channel on the Slack, and they've been polite. And so what we're doing at Online Great Books, one of the great, maybe the greatest thing we're doing is showing that you can have discussions about ideas that aren't discussions about people. Hmm. You know, you can have a, imagine in your regular life now, dear listener, because I know what it's like out there where you're afraid to say what you think about anything because people yeah. might get mad at you and cancel you. Imagine you could talk about ideas and people would respond to the idea and maybe change your mind or you change their mind. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Yeah, I've heard of that. Well, that's what we do. We We make it not personal and it, it's fun. It's what humans ought to do. Yeah, there's been a lot of argument about natural rights on there lately, too. Mm-hmm. Great. And uh, nobody hates anybody, as far as I know. No, yeah, I don't hate them because they believe they exist. Because they believe they exist or they believe natural rights exist? Yeah, because they believe natural rights exist. I don't hate them for that. They're wrong. But that's okay. I think they might be right, but they don't know the source. But that would be another podcast. Uh-oh. Um, I think it's best that we act as though they're, they're real, but we need to carry around in our back pocket a little folded up piece of paper that says it's a scam. (laughs) Take it out every now and then when you forget and look at it. Natural rights are a scam. Well, yeah, the concept might not be overly useful. Yeah. People worry very much about it. It's best if I act like you do and not punch you in the head all the time. Well, the problem is you got to reach advantage. (laughs) <laughs> it's true. Carl's arm 
uh, only reaches to his elbow. <laughs> yeah, I got to lean down to get my keys out of my pocket. Yeah, it's terrible. Well, there's another show. I hope you guys liked it. Now, we've already talked about this off the air. Next week, we're going to talk about... Actually, this is probably going to be two shows because Carl's going to go have some fun with his family and not want to lug a bunch of recording equipment, which is good. Hope you guys have a good vacation. Carl. Mm-hmm. And then... Oh my gosh, I'm losing my mind. Raymond Chandler's The Big Sleep, right? Right. Yeah. Great dialogue in there. Great story. It's going to be fun. It's a good one. Got anything on the burner for after ORC? I was thinking we ought to, maybe we ought to hit some of these really popular novels of the last hundred years. Of the last hundred years? Yeah. like Gone with the Wind? Yeah, maybe. Grace is reading that right now. But just some of these big hits that have something to chew on. <laughs> what would that be? Well, we already did Lord of the Rings. We did Dune. Okay. We're going to do, uh, we're going to do um, The Big Sleep. We'll find some... some Vonnegut. Yeah, we could. I know you'd, you'd have to hold your nose. Ah, I'd be, I'll live. Catch 22. I used to love that. Would you still? I don't think so. I don't know. You going to do Catch 22 after that? I think we should. We're going to do it eventually. Right? It's been a while. I haven't read it since high school. One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Catch-22, On the Road, all that kind of shit. I used to love it. We're never going to do Catcher in the Rye. No, I can't do it. I won't do it. I care for myself way too much. <laughs> that one's never going to happen. No, Catcher in the Rye, its days are almost over. You know, the, as the when the last baby boomer shuffles off this mortal coil, people will forget about it and no one will ever read it again. I already forgot about it. What a piece of chunk. All right, guys. Thank you so much for listening. Bone up there on the big sleep, and we'll all talk about that thing together on the next show. Talk to you soon.